Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, this beautiful center, the Islamic Institute. And uh, thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, I am indeed pure Houstonian, original cowboy. <laughs> and uh, was born and raised here, spent uh, some of my happiest days in Houston growing up. So the topic today is on the dangers of liberalism. And this is something that I speak about very often. And I think it is a topic that is in urgent need of discussion and intellectual engagement. Um, and what I would like to do for you tonight, inshallah, um, in about a total of 45 minutes of speaking, is to define for you what liberalism is, because this is a term that uh, many don't understand fully, or they misunderstand what is the definition of liberalism. And then I want to speak to you about its impact in the world today at large, affecting both Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, particularly within the American context. And then I want to share with you uh, the dangers of liberalism and give you four concrete areas of impact, negative impact of liberal thought. Um, and you know, overall, I'm not going to present uh, solutions in this short 45 minutes. I want us first to understand the scope of the problem and what is at stake. Okay, because if we don't understand that first and foremost, then we won't be motivated as a community, as individuals to pursue solutions and to pursue a way to solve these issues that, again, not only impact Muslims, but impact all of humanity. And I think Muslims are in a unique position where we can offer solutions that come from our faith, that come from Islam, and uh, we can be an inspiration and we can provide inspirational solutions that others around the world can also see and learn from and be inspired by. So let me uh, start off by noting three seemingly disparate phenomena, okay? Three seemingly disparate phenomena uh, that affects uh, Muslims primarily. The first one is, why do we see so many Muslim youth leaving Islam? Why do we see so many Muslim youth leaving Islam, becoming dissatisfied with Islam? And this is something that I'm sure many of you have had experience with family members or maybe even children. Uh, this, is a, this is a very big phenomenon that is affecting the Muslim community. We have youth who are finding Islam and religion in general irrelevant. Okay. And the statistics show that out of every four young people that is raised as Muslim, one of those four ends up leaving Islam. Okay. So that's 25% of those who are raised as Muslims their whole lives. Their parents are Muslims. They are raised as Muslims. 25% end up leaving. Islam. So that's one, one phenomenon that we can take note of. The other one is, look at the Muslim world at large. Okay, Just turn on the TV, read the newspaper, and we can see that there are, the whole entirety of the Muslim world is in disarray. There's just chaos. Okay, Many, of, many Muslim countries are facing political turmoil, they're facing social turmoil. And this can also be very uh, depressing, okay? Sometimes we just have to turn off the TV, not read the newspaper, if we don't want uh, to be impacted by all of the sadness and chaos that we are seeing within our own Muslim societies. So that's the second phenomenon. The third phenomenon is calls for reform. Calls for reforming Islam. Okay, this is something that is featured prominently within such uh, news outlets as the New York Times. Every few months they have an op-ed or an article about how Muslims need to reform their religion, how Islam needs to go through a reformation in the same way that Christianity has experienced a reformation in its history, in its intellectual history. 
Um, so there are plenty of external calls for reforming Islam, but even internally, internally Muslims are calling for the reform of their religion. And there was a Pew survey that showed that 52% of American Muslims believe that their religion, that traditional Islam needs to be reformed. Okay, it needs to be changed, updated, brought up to date. 52%, so I mean over half. So these are three phenomena that we might think are separate, but in fact they're all related. They're all united by a single theme, and that is the theme of liberalism, okay? That is the central paradigm that is underlying these three disparate phenomena. Youth leaving Islam, seeing Islam as irrelevant, the Muslim world being in disarray, and all of these calls, and all of this pressure for Muslims to change and reform and evolve Islam, Islamic law, and, and the Islamic religion. So my claim to you is that all of these are related by this idea of liberalism, okay? This trend, this liberal philosophy, okay? So as Muslims, if we want to address these issues, what is at the core of these issues, okay? What is at the core of that? And that's liberalism. So if I tell someone, and you know, I give, uh, I speak on liberalism very often, and sometimes Muslims will question, well, this is not really an important topic. You know, you're being very nitpicky. Why are you putting all of this pressure or all of this attention on this subject of liberalism? It's not very uh, critical given our circumstances. And whenever I get this, I'm shocked. I'm surprised. Okay, do you not see? That liberalism, in fact, is underlying all of these problems? Don't you understand and recognize that it's liberalism that has caused so much chaos and turmoil, turmoil for the Muslim mind, for the Muslim family, for the Muslim society, past and present? So I'm shocked when I find apathy amongst Muslims that I speak to. So, I, you know, these three phenomena that I mentioned to you, I'll justify, okay, why is it liberalism that is underlying all of these? But first we have to define what liberalism is, okay? So when I speak of liberalism, I don't mean liberalism as political philosophy, okay? or. The, the politics of liberal and conservative, left and right. That's not what I'm referring to when I speak of liberalism. I'm speaking of philosophical liberalism. Liberalism with a capital L, okay? So this uh, liberalism with a capital L is a huge umbrella that encompasses many smaller ideologies, okay? And left and right within uh, American politics or politics in general in the West all fall under this larger umbrella of philosophical capital L liberalism. Okay, so what is this philosophical liberalism? It began with 18th and 19th century British and French philosophers who theorized that the purpose of life and the purpose of all just politics and the purpose of all just moral systems is to maximize liberty and freedom. Okay, let me repeat that. The purpose of life is to maximize personal liberty and freedom, okay? So if you have a political philosophy or a moral philosophy, if it maximizes freedom, then that's good. That's, we would call that just, that's justice. Whereas if it decreases, if you have a specific philosophy, political program or moral program that decreases liberty, decreases freedom, then that's unjust, that's evil, 
Okay, and we need to strive as a human civilization to get rid of any kind of moral program or political program that decreases personal liberty and freedom. Okay, so, such as, for example, religion. Okay, so these 18th and 19th century British and French philosophers had a personal animus against religion, especially traditional religion. And so John Locke, if you've you know, read about John Locke in, in college or even in high school, uh, Thomas Hobbes, Jeremy Bentham, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Condorcet, uh, these are just a few. Okay, Thomas Jefferson, the founding fathers of America, were also liberals, philosophical liberals. Okay, meaning they all subscribe to this idea of personal liberty and freedom being the highest ideal for which we should all strive. And if you look at this history okay, of philosophical liberalism, so many different Western ideologies fall within that larger umbrella. So if you ask, for example, the left in American politics whether personal liberty and freedom is this high, is a high ideal that we should all, all should strive for and that government should facilitate, Democrats will say yes, of course. Okay? If you ask the right, if you ask Donald Trump, uh, if you ask uh, Republicans in general, they'll agree as well. They'll agree that liberty and freedom is this highest ideal. This is what the country was founded on, in fact, they'll claim that Western civilization was founded on this principle. Okay, so they're, they're not going to disagree, the left or the right. They just, their only disagreement is how that personal liberty can be achieved. Okay, and so many examples can be given. Uh, for example, gun, gun rights. The right says that having the right to bear arms is what is necessary for maximizing a person's liberty, and the left Democrats will argue that no, we need to have we need to highly regulate arms because that is decreasing from personal liberty and safety, etc., etc. So, the, but they don't disagree on the value and the importance of liberty and freedom, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so just based on that example, we can see you know the beginnings of a critique of liberalism because we can say, okay, well, how do we define freedom? How do we define liberty? Okay, is it something that can be uh, made concrete and defined in a very specific way? Or is it just endlessly open to interpretation? Is it endlessly vacuous such that anyone can put in their interpretation of what is freedom, what is liberty? You know, after all, if you look at Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the official name of their party is the Freedom and Justice Party, right? Even they claim to be striving for freedom. Or if you look at, uh, in Iran, the revolution, the religious revolution, uh, in 1979, what Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini was advocating was Azadi. Azadi meaning freedom. Okay, so even within modern Muslim movements, we see this call to freedom and liberty, and even Muslims have tried to use the language of liberalism to justify their own programs. And it's not like they're using the word freedom ironically. No, they believe that through the implementation of an Islamic program, that true human freedom and liberty can be attained. Okay. So how is it possible, using the same expression of liberty and freedom, it can be claimed by Donald Trump on one side and Ayatollah Khomeini on the other. Right? They're still using the same term. That just shows us how empty and contentless this term really is. And it can be filled with whatever you want to put into it. But that's just, you know, uh, beginning of a critique, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the point of this talk is not to give you that kind of full critique, it's only to make you aware of the larger problem and, and how Muslims uh, should understand it.
So let's look at what liberalism has brought the world. And I think we are in a particular historical moment within American history to really uh, reflect uh, on the situation that is before us. Because if you look at uh, within liberalism, I mentioned it's a, it's a larger umbrella, but within that umbrella comes economic ideologies, okay, such as neoliberal free market capitalism, okay, that is a liberal ideology. Um, even libertarianism, socialism falls under that. Um, you find different political programs that fall under liberalism social theories, and even theories of sexual morality, okay? So when we look at the world around us, within this particular historical moment, what has liberalism brought the world? Okay, what has liberalism brought humanity? On the economic front, free market capitalism, okay? Look at the state of in, uh, income inequality. Look at the state of the 1% of the population owning over 50% of the world's wealth. Okay, look at the gap between rich and poor that continues to increase year by year by year. Okay, so this is on the economic front. We see over 40% of Americans now are either at or below the poverty line. Okay, poverty it continues to increase. Homelessness, hunger continues to increase. Okay. Consider the political. Okay, within uh, political liberalism, the value of democracy, this absolute uh, value of majoritarian rule. Okay, what has that resulted in within America? Well, look, look who's in the White House. Okay, the worst of people is now ruling over everyone else. Okay? And you know, Donald Trump is an easy target, right? But even prior to Donald Trump, look at the amount of corruption within Washington politics. Look at the amount of inside dealing going on within the swamp of Washington, D.C. Okay, so we can't blame it all on Trump. You know, Trump is the product of, an, of an, a political environment, right? So what does that say, if we reflect on that, what does that say about democratic ideals? Okay, democracy as, an, as a political program, as a, as a political ideal. Look at the realm of sexuality, okay? The sexual revolution of the 1960s, okay, where sexual autonomy and the right to sexual expression was prioritized and highlighted and, and championed, right? This was the sexual revolution. What is going on today all around us? What's the big controversy? Okay, Me Too. Sexual harassment. Okay. To such an extent that Within the workplace, men are saying, I can no longer feel safe when I have female colleagues because I'm worried that I might be accused of sexual harassment or what I had always thought was just my right for sexual expression is now considered sexual assault and abuse. Okay, so there's a great deal of confusion and even amongst liberal thinkers, feminist thinkers, there's no consensus, there's no agreement on, okay, well, what is this ideal of sexual autonomy? We thought it meant one thing, but it has led to this disaster, all this chaos that we're now dealing with. It has led to an environment where predators can take advantage of women. Okay, so clearly there is something wrong with this liberal ideal as far as sexual Morality is concerned. So that's economic, political, sexual. How about social? What is the uh, social impact of liberalism? The idea is, the liberal ideal is that people need to be free to express their identities and to pursue their identities. 
what do we see today? We see the rise of neo-Nazism. We see the rise of white supre supremacists who are saying that, well, if you can be black and you can be Italian or you can be Native American or you can be Indian and you can pursue your identity and celebrate your identity, well, why not I as a white man? Why can't I celebrate my heritage, my European heritage? Okay, and so this is how they justify their, you know, white supremacy. If you listen to someone like uh, Robert Spencer, okay, as a white supremacist who's gotten national attention, this is, he goes on CNN or Fox News and he advocates white supremacy on the basis of identity politics. And he says, and he invokes the language of liberalism, the ideology of liberalism. He says, well, I thought this was a free country. I thought this was a place where I could express and pursue my identity freely. Why, are, why is uh, society reacting in this negative way and trying to suppress white identity? Okay, so we see this kind of social chaos, right? Even on the, on the realm of gender, okay, you have parents who are not going to, on the birth certificate of their newborn children, put male or female, right? Because they don't want to uh, impose a gender identity on their newborn child, okay? Because, okay, well, what is gender? Okay, how can you decide what is gender? This is all a social construction that people have invented to restrict people's free choice. Okay, again, free choice, personal liberty, personal autonomy. The, this is the vocabulary that has led to all of these trends, where even a newborn's gender is not being assigned, is not being noted, recognized, and put on a birth certificate because of a tra transgender ideology that has now uh, is becoming increasingly uh, accepted and promoted and even celebrated. So economic, political, sexual, and social, on all of these fronts we can see the fruits of liberalism and we can see the impact. And by all accounts, liberalism is a failed project. And more and more people are recognizing this. It's certainly recognized, has been recognized to different, different extents within academia. And you have non-Muslim uh, uh, academics uh, within anthropology, intellectual history, sociology, who have uh, written and critiqued liberalism from all different angles, but now it's starting to trickle within, to, within mainstream discourse. And you have op-eds within the New York Times with titles like, is this the end of liberalism? And is this the end of the liberal project? There's a lot of doubt. With America's leading intellectuals on whether liberalism is really something that is going to sustain or is going to deliver on its promise. Okay. So if this is if this is the state of our American context and even the world context, where even non-Muslims are questioning liberalism and wondering, okay, is this really, we thought it was a dream, but really it's a nightmare. If we see that happening all around us and as Muslims, shouldn't alarm bells go off? Shouldn't we recognize that, okay, wow, we see it, the impact on everyone else, where we're also everyone else, we're part of this society, we're part of this world community, what's the impact to us? How are we going to protect ourselves, our community, our children, from this nightmare? Because we're not immune, okay? There's not a magic 
immunity that we have just by virtue of being Muslim. We can't be naive about what's happening around us. So this is, let me make it more specific. Okay, let me make it more specific to Muslims, and I want to mention the impact on, of liberalism on four different levels. Okay, I want to show how liberalism attacks Islamic theology, and then how liberalism attacks the Muslim individual, the Muslim psyche, and then how liberalism attacks the Muslim family, Okay, arguably the building block of Muslim society. So how does liberalism attack Muslim society as a whole? Okay, and I'm, I want to dissect this for you, and then you know I'll, I'll leave it at that and we can go to Q&A. So theology, again, let's reiterate, liberalism claims that the highest ideal the purpose of life, the purpose of all morality and human existence is the pursuit of freedom and liberty. Islam tells us to submit submission to Allah and to His religion. Okay? So just, I mean, this is just surface level, but even on the surface level we see conflict right off the bat. Okay. And when we look at the details of Islamic law, we recognize that, okay, it's law. Just like there is any moral system, any legal system has do's and don'ts. Okay, Everyone's rights are restricted by what God commands. This is something that liberalism rejects. If God is telling you do's and don'ts, he is restricting you. He is taking away from your personal autonomy and liberty. Okay, so we'll come back to this, but you can see immediately there is a very clear conflict, okay, on its face between liberalism and Islam, and, and we'll we'll look, dissect that a little bit more. But another huge underpinning of the liberal project is this idea of progress that human civilization is progressing as people gain more liberties and more freedoms and more rights seemingly so that human civilization is advancing and progressing and this is completely contradictory to the Islamic understanding of history our understanding is that the best Morally and spiritually, best generation was the generation of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then after that, and after that, and humanity is on this continuous re moral regress until the end of times, until the day of judgment. And so Islamic eschatology says that humanity towards the end of time will be much worse than it was at the time of the Prophet's generation, peace be upon him and his companions. So this liberal understanding of progress and human civilization morally advancing is contradicted by Islam's understanding of human history and human civilization on moral and spiritual levels. Okay. Because from a liberal perspective, someone who has adopted this progressive understanding of the trajectory of, of humankind would say that, no, we understand a modern person today is much more morally sophisticated and advanced in knowing what's right and wrong than someone who lived a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, and definitely 1400 years ago. Those were the Dark Ages. Okay? Those, were, that, those were medieval times. We've advanced. Humanity has gone to a different dimension, a different realm of moral sophistication. Okay? So this is the liberal progressive challenge to Islam's 
theology, okay, very clear, direct conflict, okay, that re requires, that demands a response from Muslims. So liberalism attacks Islamic theology. Liberalism attacks the Muslim psyche. Okay, and this is another common uh, trope within uh, some of these news outlets, like the New York Times or uh, Washington Post or the Atlantic, where they'll publish a personal account from a Muslim, and this Muslim has discovered newfound freedom and feels so unburdened by leaving, you know, the stricter tenets of Islamic belief and practice. Maybe it's a she, she's, you know, discarded the veil, you know, she's realized that she doesn't need prayer five times a day, fasting, to be a good person. You don't need these things to be a good person. Okay? Anything that religion requires is at most optional and typically it's a burden. Okay, so if we want to be Muslim and not abide by Islamic law, that's perfectly fine, as long as you're a good person, right? And what's defined as being a good person is usually always in accordance with Western cultural norms, right? Okay, so there one article I remember from a few years ago that was interesting was titled, uh, Practicing Islam in Short Shorts. Okay, it was written by a Muslim sister. Practicing Islam in Short Shorts, meaning that, you know, I, and, and within this article she describes how, you know, she, she used to wear the hijab, she used to, you know, uh, avoid dating and things like this, but now she's realized that those are just, you know, relics of a religious past that she doesn't have to abide by to be a good person. She still considers herself Muslim, but sometimes she might do drugs, drink, alcohol, um, you know, go uh, have re many relationships, serial monogamy with the opposite sex outside of marriage. Um, doesn't really have much connection with her parents, right? Her parents are backwards, they don't accept her for who she is, uh, her newfound identity. Okay, because religion is just a burden. The requirements of religion are just holding you back, like chains, they're chaining you. So this is very common, and, and that was just one example, but just the other week, I was talking to a uh, young Muslim in college, okay, he was a junior at a very prestigious university, and he had grown up, he had gone to religious school, okay, and his parents were very proud of him, very intelligent, uh, he would lead his parents in prayer, he would fast and pray, and by all accounts, you know, a very exemplary Muslim young man, and then he went to college, and even after years of practicing and memorizing Quran just found it irrelevant. Islam is just irrelevant. Okay. It doesn't speak to what it means to be a human being and to be a successful human being. You can be a good person, you can be a successful person. You don't need Islam for that. You don't need religion for that. Okay. And it's interesting, I mean, the first thing to note is that, well, our youth have no problem abiding by all kinds of other norms and requirements of society. Okay, it's not easy being a uh, young person in this country, okay, in terms of abiding by fashion, all kinds of requirements for being fashionable, how to dress, what kind of clothes you wear, what kind of shoes you wear, what kind of technology you have, okay, if you have the latest technology. These are all burdens. Okay, these are all things that require you to pay attention and to mold yourself into a person who abides by these kinds of standards of living. But they're not experienced as burdens. They're not experienced as 
restrictions, even though they're much more onerous, much more difficult to comply with than simple religious requirements, okay? Tattooing, right? Do you have, do you have a nice tattoo? Yeah, you literally have to stab yourself with ink. Uh, this is what's in fashion, right? But no, our youth don't consider that to be burdensome. They don't consider that to be restricting their liberty, restricting their autonomy, that they have to abide by the dictates of what society says is fashionable or not. How to wear your hair. Okay, a, a great burden for both uh, young men and young women. Okay, how you style your hair. These are all restrictions. Okay, and we could go on and on and on, but these are not experienced as chains, but when it comes to religion, liberalism conditions the Muslim mind, conditions the Christian mind, conditions the Jewish mind, conditions the religious mind to experience all of these religious requirements as burdensome, but ignore everything else, ignore all the other restrictions and dictates of culture as burdens. Okay, so this is something that we need to recognize so that we can critique properly. So this is how liberalism attacks the Muslim psyche. Liberalism makes us view religion as a burden, as a restriction on our free choice. Okay? When in fact all cultures, all, even the liberal ones, restrict Liberalism also attacks the Muslim family. Liberalism attacks family in general. Okay? Because when it comes to family, that's another set of burdens. A husband has responsibilities towards his wife. A wife has responsibilities towards her husband. A child has responsibility towards his parents. Parents have responsibility towards their children. Okay. Extended family, these are all kinship rights. Okay, that within Islam especially, we have to maintain the rights of the family. Okay, these are burdens. Liberalism tells us that these are things that we need to discard. Okay, forget about your family. Your family there's even this cliche of, oh, how terrible it is, you know, within the average American. Oh, I have to go home for the holidays. I have to deal with these people that I hate. I wish I had nothing to do with them. I hate my mom. I hate my dad. Marriage is dissolving. People are not getting married. Okay. If they get married, maybe, you know, late into their 30s. Average age of marriage keeps going up year after year. Okay, why get why bother with marriage? Okay, I want my personal freedom. I don't want to be chained. I don't want to be held back. Okay, I can just go do what I want. Birth rate has plummeted. Okay, the birth rate is so low that the population is decreasing within certain Muslim countries or certain European countries. Okay, the birth rate is so low that it's not even enough to sustain a steady population. The population is decreasing. No one wants to have kids. Why? It's a burden, it's a responsibility. Okay? It's holding us back from experiencing true our, our dreams, right? Our personal individual dreams. Okay? So this is why we see society atomizing. We're a society of individuals. And you look at Japan, okay, there was a very interesting expose within the New York Times again on Japanese society, which has also been affected by capitalistic liberalism, and their traditional society has been completely transformed in the past few generations. Within Japan, it's very lonely. You have elderly individuals who are just dying within their small apartments, within Tokyo, for example, they're dying and they're, no one even re realizes that they're dead. 
that they've died. They don't have any family. They don't have any children who will come and check on them. And the only way that people find out that they've died is because the stench of the dead body disturbs the neighbors and the neighboring flat. And there's even an, an, a cottage industry of cleaners who specialize in cleaning out apartments from these uh, lonely, dead Japanese men and women. Okay? They let the ideal life, in terms of career success, but what did that result in without family? Just a lonely death. And it's not just Japan. And in the U.S. as well. Loneliness is something that is an epidemic that is affecting everyone. So why is that? Why do we find this? It's because of this attack on the family. And what does society teach us? What does, what does liberal culture teach us? That your true family is not the, your blood relation. Your true family is your corporate family, right? Your true family is your corporate family or your friends, okay? Because you can choose your friends. This is the message that's constantly hammered home in TV, movies, culture at large. What about the TV show Friends? Okay, Friends, that's the name of it. Your true family are the people you choose to be with. Okay, at most, your blood relations are a burden that you need to put behind you and get rid of, right? And again, Muslims are not immune from this trend. Okay, Muslims are not immune from this trend. And it's very different, okay? Let's, let's look at uh, Muslims historically, okay? And even within our own cultures, okay, I'm Persian, okay, Persian culture, Turkish culture, Indian, Pakistani culture, Bangladeshi culture, and you are in context of a large extended family. You spend time with your family. Most of your time growing up is spent within a family context. Okay? That's how you grow up. You're not raised by just your parents. You're raised by your family, your, extent, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins. Okay? Large families. The average Saw, the average number of children a Muslim couple has over three, three or more within the Muslim world. Okay, and you all I'm sure have had experience with this or you come from large families yourself. Okay, there are expectations and responsibilities. Yes, that's, those are responsibilities, but they also pay dividends, okay, later in life. No one dies alone, okay. You grow old with your children. You grow old with your family. Everyone lives close together, enjoying each other's company. Okay, and I'm not idealizing. This is a lived reality. This is a lived reality that even I've experienced. I'm sure you've experienced this. But it's just the opposite within the liberal society, within the liberal structured society. No, what's most important is Pursuing your personal freedom and if you want to pursue your personal freedom You have to have a successful career and if you have a, if you want to have a successful career You can't be limited to your immediate locale with your family. No, you need to go to a different state Different city just pursue the dollar Whoever's gonna pay you the biggest paycheck right and I'm not saying like you know myself I left Houston I went to college in Boston Okay, so I'm a product of that too, but we have to reflect, okay, what is being given up? Okay, what is, what is lost when we adopt that kind of lifestyle? Okay, even myself, I've, I've been all over the country pursuing my own career, and that's come at a cost, and that's, this is part of the reason why we need to reflect. Okay, and how society, in the way it's structured today, liberal society, affects and attacks and undermines the family, and the Muslim family in particular. And finally, let's look at how liberalism attacks Muslim society. How liberalism has attacked the Muslim world. And this is 
very clear history. If you've studied colonialism, uh, decolonial studies within academia, you're well aware of how it was liberal thinkers, 18th and century, 19th century liberal thinkers who used liberalism as a tool to colonize, okay, as a tool to control and take over power of Muslims, not only Muslims, but also Native Americans, the Aboriginals in Australia, the Chinese, the Indians, okay? Liberalism was a tool in order to further the colonial project, okay, in the past. How, how was this possible? Okay, when you read, when you read the most famous liberal philosophers, John Stuart Mill, okay, he has a book on liberty. Okay, John Stuart Mill says very explicitly that liberalism, okay, well, the highest ideal is the pursuit of liberty, okay, but not the entire world, okay, other than the white race, other than the European race, people won't, don't have the mental capacity to understand the value of liberty. Okay, people around the world do not have the intelligence to recognize, to get past their cultural and religious baggage. They're not smart enough. They're not as smart as the white man. Okay, so we need to impose liberalism, and okay? we need to impose liberalism upon them by force. Okay, so this is explicit in the writing of John Stuart Mill, but not just him. John Locke, Jeremy Bentham, Montesquieu, Condorcet, all of these thinkers, liberal, the, the founders of liberal philosophy were very clear that liberalism is a civilizing mission. We need to civilize the world and bring them to the light of reason, okay? And of course, they had their own economic interests as well because these were all slave owners. Or they had big stake, a big stake within the transatlantic slave trade and imperial projects across the globe. Okay. On the one hand, they're talking, they're waxing poetic about the virtues of freedom and liberty. And on the other hand, they're profiting from imposing an imperial hegemony across the globe, okay? And so, I mean, within decolonial studies, uh, uh, this irony has been uh, written about at length, and so I won't belabor the point. But let's look at a specific context. Let's look at uh, Egypt and colonialism that happened within Egypt. And you had a certain uh, British governor who was charged with uh, controlling Egypt and setting up imperial power in Egypt, his name was Lord Cromer, okay? And Lord Cromer was very explicit about his, his project and his agenda. He said that, look, if we go to Muslims and we tell them, abandon Islam and accept European British law, they will reject that. And in fact, they will fight against us. Okay, so we can't go directly to them and tell them, abandon your faith, because they won't accept it. Rather, we should tell them to reform Islam. Okay, reform Islam, because who can deny the value of liberty? Who can deny the value of personal freedom and choice? Okay, the unsuspecting person, the unsuspecting Muslim, how can you deny that? So just reform your religion. Just reform it. And in fact, we'll take the most wealthy Muslims, Egyptian Muslims, and we'll take them back to British universities, French universities, and we'll teach them our culture. We'll teach them how to think the right thoughts, how to say the right things, how to be true liberals, and then we'll send them back to Egypt, and we'll put them in the highest governmental positions within Egyptian society. And they'll still be Muslims, but they'll be reformed Muslims. 
They'll be demuslimized Muslims. And this is a term that Lord Cromer uses. Okay? And this is how we can affect and change a deeply religious society, a deeply religious society with Muslims who take God's law as their personal imperative. Okay? And we can slowly change them so that they accept that, okay, religion is something at most, you know, what you practice on Sunday or you practice on Friday. Okay, but otherwise you're a, you abide by European law, you abide by European cultural values. This is how you can become a true reformed Muslim and join the civilized world. Okay, this is what was told to Muslims, not only in Egypt, in Turkey, okay, Ataturk. Look at what Ataturk was saying. We need to join the civilized world. What is holding us back is religion. We need to defund all of the religious schools. We need to defund the religious schools. We need to take all of the religious teachers out of their high positions within the university system. We need to defund the awqaf, the waqf. And what is the result of this? What will happen to a society? What will happen to gener generation after generation once this has occurred? It's very clear. Okay? This is how liberalism, in no uncertain terms, attacks Muslim society. Okay? So, you know, so much can be said about this. That, and then, oh, so this is an important point. One could say, oh, well, this was the past. Okay, it happened, now we know better. But no, this continues, this project continues to this day. Because, uh, go back to Egypt, who is in charge? Okay, who has been empowered? Who has been backed? CC now, before him, Hosni Mubarak. Okay, a whole series of secular, secular dictators that have been propped up. Why? Because they're able to separate religion from state power and keep the Islamists in check and make sure Islam doesn't affect and undermine the secular law. Okay, the secular values of the country. So these dictators are kept there by Western powers on purpose. This is not a coincidence, right? This is a continuation of the imperial program. Look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia. Right? And we don't necessarily have to endorse everything that was happening in Saudi in the past, but what's happening now is even worse. Right? The crown prince has defunded and undermined so much of the religious scholarship and scholarly class within that country. Right? And is affecting all of these liberal reforms in the name of moderate Islam. Okay, moderate Islam is the same as reformed Islam is the same as liberal Islam. Right? So this project is continuing up to this very moment. So this is how liberalism undermines and attacks Islamic theology, attacks the Muslim individual, the Muslim psyche, attacks the Muslim family, and ultimately attacks Muslim society and the Muslim world. Okay. Very clear. So we have to recognize that this is happening. And we should, we should feel like we are being attacked. Okay. We can't just go through life not reflecting on the impact of this. And if you haven't felt the impact in your own personal life, then guaranteed you know family, you have family that has been impacted directly. And if you don't have family, then you can see the impact to uh, society. You can see the impact to our homelands, our countries. And if you can't see that, at least recognize what's happening around us within this context. Okay, it's very clear and unequivocal. So how do we address this? 
you know, I don't want to uh, keep you here for another five hours <laughs> and launch a critique of uh, liberal thought. But it, it has been critiqued at length uh, within Western academia even. And my call to most, the Muslim community, especially within uh, the US and Europe, is that we have a responsibility. Okay, This, this uh, threat of liberalism is not something new. Colo the colonial project is over 200 years old. Okay, so this is not something new. We need to you know, get our act together. And it's not purely a spiritual issue. Okay, spirituality is certainly, without a doubt, part of the problem. But it's also an intellectual issue. Okay, we have to be able to launch an intellectual critique, uh, intellectual deconstruction, and this is not something that our faith tradition, the Islamic tradition, is unfamiliar with. Okay? This is not the first time an ideology, a philosophy, okay, has been introduced and has attacked Islam. Okay? We have a long history of scholarship that has addressed other such attacks in our history, okay, when it comes to Aristotelianism, Platonism, and so forth, okay, Greek philosophy. So what is our our response to this new challenge, okay, new in the sense of our entire 1400 year history, okay, but it's something that we need to get our act together, we need to dedicate resources, okay, where are the resources dedicated to this in the Muslim community, okay, are we, are we funding people who are able to launch their critiques and deconstructions, are we creating institutions and schools that are creating curricula that can systematically, okay, not reactionary, okay, I'm not interested in being reactionary. We need deep, deep, profound critiques, and we can do that. We have the intellectual resources at our disposal, we have the intellectual tradition of Islam at our disposal. We can do, okay, we can do great things intellectually on this issue. Okay, it's a, but it's just a matter of recognizing the problem. First and foremost, recognizing the problem, and then we can, we can address it, inshallah. So with that, uh, I'll conclude. Subhanahu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun, wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.